Good morning, church. Welcome to worship with First Christian Church in Bartlesville. Uh, if you're watching virtually today, worshiping with us virtually, please take a moment to fill out the contact card. I'd like to extend a special welcome to a couple of visitors here today that we have in our midst. Um, our announcements for today, our item that we're collecting for concern in July, toothbrushes and toothpaste, and then for August, we're switching to fruit cups. So um, we'll be collecting those in the usual ways. Uh, after worship today, executive committee is going to be meeting just for a very brief meeting following worship. Prayer group meets on Monday at one o'clock and our trustees are going to be meeting at four o'clock on Monday. So I hope that you'll note those things on your calendar. Are there other announcements? If not, let's enter into worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Give thanks to God and call on God's name. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Make known God's deeds among the people. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Seek God's presence and God's strength. Let us sing praises to God, for God is faithful.
Thank you. You may be seated. Marty, my voice is pretty weak today, so you may have to you may have to raise the volume. Are you all able to hear me? Okay. 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 Sounds good. Um, just a note on our prayer hymn. Uh, we'll on this prayer hymn. We will only be singing verses one and two. So just verses one and two on our prayer hymn. We've entered into our time of prayer, our time of sharing with each other, our time of, of offering up to each other and to God our joys and our concerns. What do you bring with you today? Yes. Five great grandchildren visiting. That's wonderful. Are you worn out? Oh, that's great. That's great. That's a wonderful joy to have five great-grandchildren with you. God, in your mercy. Yes. A new great-great-granddaughter born last Wednesday, and her name is Nevaeh Park. That's beautiful. Oh, another joy. Good. God in your mercy. All right. Your Uncle Wes fell again. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Well, prayers for steadiness and for healing. God in your mercy. Debbie, you want to give us an update on your mom? Okay. Harriet went to Adams Park on Thursday afternoon? Wednesday afternoon, yeah. So, and you said she can have visitors at this point. So that's, that's good. I'm sure she'd appreciate visits. God in your mercy. It's been great to have you guys. God in your mercy. Oh, Mary, hi. Okay. Mary asks for prayers, for guidance, for decisions that she's making. God, in your mercy, please bow with me in prayer. Our gracious and ever-loving God, we come in the midst of summer looking for refreshment. We rest in the knowledge of the wonderful works that you've done for us and of the deep and abiding love that you have for us and for all of your people. Search our hearts. Fill our souls with your indwelling spirit who whispers to us that all will be well. We pray for healing and strength for Harriet, for Lee, for Mary, for Loretta. We give you thanks for the skilled surgeons and pray that you will guide their hands during Renee's surgery this week. Well, God, we ask that you shine your light before us, lead us, and guide us so that we can see the path that you would have us to take to bring your kingdom to earth. This we pray through Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm going to slip in an extra scripture on you today. Um, if the first one is a brief reading from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. And our gospel reading today is from the gospel according to John chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not be enough, would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him the king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got in a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea was rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May God add blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these words of Scripture. It is a miracle that prophet Elijah in the Hebrew Bible feeds 100 people with a sack of barley loaves and just a few sheaves of grain. Then, in the New Testament, John tells us of a similar story, a similar event, this time not 100 people, but 5,000 people who were fed with five barley loaves and two fish. Again, a miracle. And let's not forget at the close of this section, Gospel according to John, where Jesus was left behind, they actually left him behind and went several miles offshore Jesus scares the devil out of them. He walks on water out to meet them. Another miracle, or as John calls them, a sign. You know, miracles in the Christian tradition can be a huge stumbling block for many. We are postmodern individuals who place a goodly amount of value on reason and thinking what we can verify with our senses, with research, with facts. 
the world is definitely a better place because we can think and reason, explore and verify. Science has improved our health. We live longer, more comfortable lives. We've developed modern farming techniques that improve the yields and resistance against the diseases and pests that can plague the crops. Science and reason are not the enemy of religion or of faith, but science and reason are not always enough. Without faith and mystery and room in our lives for the things that defy explanation, there's still a hunger within us. Something's missing. Our souls long to have something to sustain them for longer than the next spiritual flash in the pan. And coupled with our hunger is fear. Life is uncertain. And like the disciples on the lake watching Jesus walk on the water in the darkest of night, we long for peace. We long for reassurance. We want to know that everything's going to be okay in the end. In the Gospel of John, we read in the final, we read in the final two verses. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may become to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That's how the book concludes. Through these signs and wonders, we may come to belief. Well, this may have been a comforting statement to the people of Jesus' time, but sometimes it just causes us to scratch our heads. For people seeking faith in an age of reason, again, it doesn't seem to help the case for Christianity. And yet we are told that these were written so that we could believe, and more than that, so that we could understand who Jesus is. In John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't hide his identity in the shadows. He plainly tells everyone, from the woman at the well to the disciples, I am. As God told Moses on the mountain, I am. Do not be afraid. It is I. Literally, I am. The power in these signs and in these miracles is not in their ability to amaze us. The power is in the way that they invite us to see Jesus as the one who leads us to bread and to peace and ultimately to live lives seeking to follow his, understand, his example. Tucker Palmer is a teacher, a writer, and an activist who has a real gift for helping people to find purpose in their lives and in their work. He's deeply spiritual. He's a member of the Religious Society of Friends. Um, we know them as the Quakers. In his book, The Active Life, Palmer devotes an entire chapter to the feeding of the 5,000 and where the true miracle of the story lies. He sees the story in part as commentary on the mindset of abundance versus the mindset of scarcity. When people are isolated, Palmer says, sticking to themselves or to one small little group, the world can seem like a place where everything is in short supply. We begin to believe that we have to hoard things, or at the very least, that we will need to, have to pay for things at a steep cost. This mindset of scarcity is a huge downside to the American philosophy of rugged individualism and the myth of self-sufficiency. We can accurately call this a myth because no one, I don't care who you are, no one is completely self-sufficient 100% of the time. When on the other hand, we allow ourselves to become a part of a community like this community in Christ, miracles of a sort can begin to happen all around us. Surrounded by others, suddenly bread appears at our doorstep brought by a neighbor. Friends drop by, and we share our burdens, and all of a sudden we don't need to pay someone to listen to our troubles as often. Maybe a yard gets mowed by a neighbor who has noticed that we haven't been up to the task lately. Abundance really kind of sneaks up on us when we live in community. 
Jesus asked Philip a fairly reasonable question. He asked where they were going to find enough bread to feed all of those people. But John tells us that Jesus was testing Philip. Jesus knew exactly where the bread was going to come from. And then he did something really interesting. He set them down in companies. He set them down in small groups out on that lawn. And he fed them. Suddenly there was enough. The people were satisfied. When I go to a potluck dinner or a funeral dinner for a family, I often hear echoes of this, of this miracle. People show up unexpectedly bringing extra dishes, or someone new in the church comes, casserole in hand that we hadn't expected. We realize that we don't have enough desserts. Everyone seems to have brought salads, but then looking in the freezer, we find that leftover dessert there from the women's meeting. Is this a miracle like the loaves and the fishes? Did God somehow find a way to make a way? Well, yes and no. Probably not in the David Copperfield kind of sleight of hand fashion. The true miracle is when we come together in our homes and churches and parks, working on Habitat for Humanity houses, in the concern pantry, in the town hall meetings, wherever we gather to minister to each other and to serve our neighbors in imitation of Christ. That's where the miracle occurs. And there is enough. As with the loaves and the fishes, we often have more than enough to satisfy a whole host of needs and hungers. You've probably seen the newer t-shirts or bumper stickers that try to move us out of our scarcity mindset, not with regard to food or physical goods as such, but in relation to the quest for equal and fundamental rights for human beings. The saying that you may have seen on those t-shirts and, and the bumper stickers goes like this. Equal rights for others doesn't mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. Equal rights for others doesn't mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. When we, as individuals, begin to move away from the notion that if we give, that if we give rights to someone else, that we're going to lose things, there again we begin seeing God creating abundance in our midst, and everyone is enriched. I have a friend who has been on a very impressive journey to improve his health over the last two years. I found out this week he is just seven pounds away from losing 100 pounds. It's amazing. But he's tired. It's been a long journey, those two years. He's tired. In his words on social media, he said he needed his friends to do two things for him. First thing was to cowboy up. Have you heard that expression? You got to cowboy up to toughen up and to get the strength to work through the struggle. Here's what one person offered in response. She said, rope what you need to rope, ride where you need to ride, herd what you need to herd. Your friends will settle up and be there with you on the journey. Isn't that profound? Rope what you need to rope. We all have times when we need help, when we can't go it alone, and we know that we need to cowboy up, that we can't do it without some help. And the blessing of following Jesus' example of living in community is that we can anticipate the miraculous happening. There is help, and there is hope. There are companions who are waiting to saddle up to ride on the journey with us. We do what we can on our own. We rope what we need to rope. We ride what we need to ride, and we herd what we need to herd. The miracle is that the people around us are truly ready to settle up and to ride us, ride with us, to rope what we can't rope alone. As we bless others, we also find out that we're blessed. My friend said one more thing, though. I said he asked for two things, help with cowboying up, and he said he also needed to be prayed up, to be prayed up. There's that third leg 
of the three-legged stool of the Christian faith, the Christian life. We've got you and me alone. We've got our community. And we've got the holy. We've got God. God doesn't ask us to go it alone or to continue our journey only with human assistance. God wants us to call on the great I am for peace and for strength. God wants us to leave room in our rational, well-ordered lives for the mystery and the miracle of faith. Sometimes we follow Jesus into a beautiful grassy wilderness to be fed, but other times we go out on our own and Jesus pursues us in the dark, in the waters, the murkiness of our lives. Either way, the effect is the same. We are witness to miracles. We participate in those miracles. And those miracles are waiting for us to claim Jesus as the I am. If you're able, saddle up to ride with the folks who need a miracle around you. But if the tables are turned and you're the one who needs help, look around you and accept the miracle of community as it comes to you graciously and with joy. That's a part of our life together, the giving and the receiving. People are waiting to help you cowboy up and to pray you up. People are waiting to be partners in God's service. Amen. When you place your offerings in the offering plate each week, we do it first out of knowledge. We have knowledge that it's going to be used for a good cause, that it's going to be used to further God's kingdom here on earth. But we also see mysterious and wonderful ways that what we offer seems to be more than enough, more than enough to do miraculous work for God. We give in response to the gifts and the blessings that we have been given. And in imitation of Christ, our blessings are now distributed to those who are in need. Please rise as we dedicate our offerings. <laughs> This weekend, many of us have been watching the Olympics, opening ceremonies, that swimmer winning, winning the very first gold medal. There's been a lot of behind-the-scenes reporting on every aspect of the Games. Did you know that they feed about 48,000 meals every single day in the, Olympic, in the Olympic Village? I am glad that I'm not in charge of that potluck dinner. All of those athletes from all of those countries, all their different dietary preferences and needs and wants, especially with elite athletes, there's a lot. There's a lot to do. 2,000 years ago, on the Galilee Lakeshore, 5,000 people gathered to be fed, and Jesus accomplished something Kind of similar to what they do at the Olympic Village, Jesus was able to satisfy each one according to what he or she needed. He catered the diet exactly to their specifications. And our joy today comes in knowing that we're not in competition for God's love. We're not in competition with each other, not at this table. All are invited, all are welcome. And we will be fed and nourished. There will be nothing that is lost 
and no one who was lost. Let us pray. God of peace, we pause in the midst of our busy and anxious lives to come into your presence and partake of this communion meal. Steal our hearts, center our minds, quiet our anxious spirits that we may know your peace. Let the bread that we now eat together strengthen and nourish us. We lift this cup before you, seeking your blessing upon it and seeking your spirit to be poured out into our lives. Let this moment of communion be moments of renewal and rededication for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his friends, with his disciples, his followers, he took a loaf of bread and giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. He shared it with them. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took a cup and he poured it. He explained that this was no ordinary cup. This cup was a covenant renewed in his blood. Each time that we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember him until he comes again. Partake in love. Partake in joy. We had so many hymns and, and songs that you all recommended last week that we didn't get to for our hymn sing, and I've given the ones that we weren't able to sing to Lisa, and today we are actually going to sing one that was requested by several people. It is in the back of your hymnal, pasted in on the back cover, as most of you know.
Here we go. You didn't notice I was stalling so Lisa could get up to her, to the organ, did you? <laughs> and now I dismiss you with a blessing, with a charge asking you to, to look around you, look for your neighbors, look for those who can help you, look for those that you can help. Go and find the miracle in your community each and every day. Amen. Thank you.